So he's got to take all of his observations of where other planets are taken from the surface of the Earth and translate them into a framework where the Earth and these planets are themselves both revolving around the Sun. So he knows that uh, over the course of a year, uh, the Earth will have come around a complete circle, a complete orbit around the Sun, but Mars will have, come, will have done less of a loop around the Sun because it takes longer. And so this year, uh, the angle to Mars was there. At this same time last year, the angle to Mars was there. He's got to take all of those data, translate them into a, a, an axis where the Sun is at the center of the universe, and figure out by hand, because there were no calculators, there were no computers, whether those dots for where, the Earth, where Mars was a year ago versus this year versus you know, two years ago, do those all line up on a circle? Is Mars going around the sun in a circle or not? And he's able to tell that, no, there's no circle I can put Mars's dots on that will fit these data. It's got to be something else. It has to be an ellipse. And, um, I mean, it's just mind-blowing that the guy uh, was able to do this. Um, was not a was not an easy life, uh, and he contributed a lot to us uh, through that. Um, so, I mean, the first and second laws came first. Actually, uh, Kepler created his second law before he formalized his first law. The fact that he allowed planets to move at different speeds allowed him, which was his second law, allowed him to actually figure out the first law, even though they're numbered the other way. Um, and uh, they both uh, you know, relate to a single planet going around the sun. So if we have you know, the sun here, no planet has an orbit that is this elliptical. But just intuitively, you think about a planet, let's do blue for the Earth here. When, when the Earth is here at this point in its orbit, it's basically its orbital vector is pointing off in this direction. We now know that what's driving this is the gravitational attraction from the Sun. So what is the Sun going to, um, what effect is the Sun going to have on the planet Earth as it is at this point? It's going to be the gravitational pull of the sun is going to be pulling on the earth in this direction. Maybe I'll make this black. Which is um, a combination of pulling the earth in toward the center of the ellipse and also pulling it forward a bit. So basically anywhere along here, you know, if, you think, if you do the same thing with the earth over here, where it's orbital velocity is pointing off in that direction. What impact the sun is going to have is going to be pull it this way, which is going to be pulling the earth in and forward. Basically, anywhere along here, the earth is going to be speeding up. It's going to be going faster and faster until it reaches this point, which is known as what? Point closest uh, to the sun. Perihelion. And then by the time Mar Earth gets onto its outbound orbit, outbound part of the orbit, where its orbital velocity, its trajectory is, is going to be out that way, what the Sun will be doing is pulling it in this direction, which again will be pulling it in toward the center of the ellipse, but backwards. So it's going to be going slower and slower and slower as it's going on this outbound part of the trajectory until it gets over here to aphelion. Okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, you can memorize the law, first law that planets go around in an ellipse and that they go fastest when they're closest to the sun. But this is why. They're going around in an ellipse because their orbit is constantly being pulled in 
by the effect of gravity, and that's going to bend the orbit around in this elliptical path. And basically, you can consider the aphelion being the top of the hill. Like if you threw a ball up, it would go slower and slower and slower as gravity's pulling on it until it reached a high point where it would be stopped, and then it would be going faster and faster coming down. So slow out here, and then faster and faster and faster over here. So I think for most students, the first and second laws are more straightforward. Okay? I can draw an ellipse. I can remember faster when it's closer to the sun because the sun's pulling on it more. You know, something along those lines. The third law is more difficult, but um, it's really critical in a couple of ways. Basically, this was a uh, relationship that showed that um, showed mathematically that uh, the time a planet takes to go around the sun, the square of that, is directly proportional to the cube of the distance away. Now that's kind of arcane, it sounds kind of esoteric, but uh, what this does is it allows us to do two things. It allows Isaac Newton to come up with his law of gravitation because he was then able um, to show mathematically that the gravitational pull of the sun is what was involved in that proportion. And that's uh, more than we want to cover in, in the class here. But it also helps provide a yardstick for the solar system. If we know that uh, Mars takes 1.88 years to go around the sun, then its orbit is about 50% further out from the sun than the Earth. So the third law of uh, planetary motion basically allows you to define the orbital period and the distance for all the planets based on what's going on in the Earth. So, you know, Earth takes one year to go around. Earth is one astronomical unit away from the Sun. Uh, all the other planets line up in this relationship based on that mathematical proportion. So this, you know, lets you know that based on how long it takes Jupiter to go around the Sun, it's about five times out further out from the sun than the Earth is. Now, this yardstick at this point is all just relative. You know, Mars is not quite twice as far away from the sun as the Earth. But if you can measure any one of those distances absolutely, then you've got everything. And uh, we won't have time to take a look at the video, but basically... Uh, there, were, there was an international project <clears throat> back in the 1800s to measure the transit of Venus across the sun from different locations on the Earth. And by triangulating when Venus touched and left the sun from the different locations on Earth, that allowed uh, astronomers to determine the distance between Venus and Earth. It's a straight kind of parallax. If you, uh, you know, if you hold your thumb out and you close on and open up one eye and, and, and it kind of moves back, your thumb will move back and forth across the background. Once we've got the distance between Venus and the Sun, then we've got the distance from the Earth to the Sun, and then we've got the distance from the Sun to Jupiter, Sun to Mercury. We know that... Uh, you know, um, how many hundreds of thousands and millions of kilometers our solar system is. And that was going to be the segue to do the scale model of the solar system. So we will plan to do that next time. Um, we will also plan to talk a little bit about some of the main um, advancements 
in the mapping Mars period. But again, I will carve out some time for you meet as your groups to um, um, discuss those chapters in um, Mars as the Boat of Life. What? That's next class. Uh, we'll be talking about Mars as a Void of Life in two sessions, but next session I want you as groups to kind of talk about it. So if I didn't, if you came in after I called roll, let me know, and um, I won't bother having you hand in those uh, papers that I had that you worked on. So Charlie or Felix or Elaine, Milo, Milo. Milo. Okay. Hi, I'm Skyler. How are you doing? Thank you for No problem.